Welcome to the Secular Hub, a community where atheists, agnostics, humanists, and their families can meet, support each other, have fun, and explore ethics, science, and the human condition. Today, we hear from Dr. Beth Malmskog. The title of the talk, Mathematics and Fair Redistricting using random maps to put Colorado in context. All right. So in 29, excuse me, in 2018, uh, the people of Colorado voted on amendments Y and Z, establishing a bipartisan redistricting commission to draw our legislative and congressional district maps. On its face, it sounds like a win, but it does beg the question, what's fair? Intuitively, it sounds simple enough, but you know, what happens when you dig deeper? So redistricting was on my mind when I stumbled across an article in which Dr. Beth Malmskog was quoted um, speaking to how she and her students were exploring that critical question of fairness, a question that, that a select group of Colorado, Coloradans excuse me, will have to answer uh, here soon as the state selects candidates to serve on our legislative and congressional redistricting committees. So wouldn't it be great to have Dr. Malmskog share her insights, I thought, and so I reached out and she kindly agreed to speak with us. Dr. Momskog is an assistant professor of mathematics at Colorado College. She grew up in Laramie, Wyoming, and earned her PhD in 2011 from Colorado State University. Her current research focuses on number theory, geometry, and discrete mathematics. And when she applies herself, it's toward problems like error correcting codes, cryptography, as well as developing computational tools for number theory research. Dr. Momskog is also part of a research group studying the mathematics of fear redistricting with a focus on Colorado. So with that, Dr. Momskog, we are glad that you could join us. I hand the floor to you. Uh, thank you so much, Chauncey, for um, inviting me and introducing me to this very cool community. I'm really excited to speak with you all. Um, and for probably the most thoughtful introduction to a talk that I've ever gotten, because this is exactly what attracted me to this question is like, what is fair? What does that even mean? And I started um, thinking about this in the context of redistricting. And um, it turns out that there is still not one answer that pleases me on this. So um, I hope that if nothing else, we can complicate the idea of what fairness might mean a little bit um, through the course of this talk and give maybe a new tool for considering what fairness would mean in the context of redistricting and sort of new way to look at it. Um, okay, so Really, this, the title for this presentation that I gave you is very long, so I shortened it a little bit to Mathematics, Context, and Fair Redistricting. And that's what this um, talk is really about. Um, there's a lot of different ways that math can interact with fairness in contexts that other people have um, spoken about and explained in other cases. But this is the first framework that I've really seen that really uses context to bring fairness or to talk about fairness in redistricting. And I think that is that's what you're going to want to keep an eye out for here is like, why does context matter to fairness? Um, okay, so let me just start off with a quick thanks. Um, in this 100th anniversary of the 19th Amendment, I have to say thanks to all the suffragists um, who did, worked so hard. I definitely would not be here without the suffragists um, having, you know, worked so hard for women to have the right to vote. Um, I also have to thank this woman in particular, Moon Duchin. Um, so she is a mathematician at uh, Tufts University. And she was a very um, successful, is a very successful mathematician in uh, like pure math ways. She studied geometry and billiards. Um, but a few years ago, she got very interested in this question of redistricting and how geometry and mathematics might be able to play a role. And she like took the show on the road and started by sort of setting up some seminars um, around um, her university at Tufts. She created what's called the Metric Geometry and Gerrymandering Group, which is a working group at Tufts and MIT, and um, sort of organized a series of seminars across the country that 
it really brought this work to, um, out in an unprecedented way. I've never seen a mathematical concept spread so widely. Um, and she's an incredibly um, great mathematician and a charismatic person who really cares about the world. And so I got to say thanks to her um, for for bringing me into this uh, study in the first place. Um, this is a topic I knew nothing about before I went to Moon's first seminar. Um, and I have now made it one of the main features of my research program. So she uh, had a real effect. Okay, so what am I talking about? All this build up, what am I getting to? Redistricting and representation. Okay, so we all know we live in a democracy and it, that it is in fact a representative democracy in some ways. We don't all vote on everything ourselves. We elect other people to vote on those things for us so that we don't have to be informed on all of the details of government. Um, so in particular, um, the legislative branch has the two um, houses, the House and the Senate. The U.S. House ha um, is 435 seats, and they're apportioned to the states based on population. Um, so it's been at 435 for a long time, and there's a pretty good discussion to be had about how maybe um, that level of representation is um, too coarse for the um, country and that maybe we need some more representatives in there. But for now, this is what it is, and this is what we have to work with. In addition, um, okay, so they, they apportion these seats in whole numbers, which results in some very strange things. For example, my state of Wyoming getting a whole seat, when by the numbers, it definitely doesn't um, deserve one. Um, but each state gets at least one seat. And then within the states after um, they're apportioned, you need to, if there is more than one seat, divide the state up into single member geographic districts um, for the number of seats that the state has been apportioned. Okay, so in Colorado, for example, you can see that we have seven seats, and so we've had to divide the um, state into seven geographic regions. Again, this is a point where a lot of people um, have the excellent point to make that um, maybe this is not the best way to do it. Maybe you could have multi-member districts. There's a lot of different things. Um, but again, this talk starts from where we are now, which is um, we're legally required to have single member geographic districts in every state. So um, going from there, that's, that's where we are. Um, I love this picture just because it's so colorful. And that's one of the other exciting things about the, studying this is that you get to make a lot of maps and see a lot of very colorful and beautiful pictures throughout, the, throughout this. This is more colorful than number theory. Okay, so when we have um, di single member geographic districts like this, we immediately run into the question of how to draw the lines, um, which takes us immediately to gerrymandering. So what is gerrymandering? Well, on the right-hand side of your screen, you see Elbridge Gerry and you see Gerry's Salamander, which is the first, um, the namesake of gerrymandering, and, um, but probably not the first time that gerrymandering has occurred. So what is this? It's just the, par the process of drawing district lines to benefit someone, intentionally manipulating the district lines. In this talk, I'll mostly talk about partisan gerrymandering. And so in this case, we're talking about um, drawing lines to benefit a political party. Um, who would do this? Well, um, redistricting is most often done by state legislatures. Each state legislature is charged with sort of redrawing these lines. And so if there's a party that's dominant in the state legislature, then it can draw lines for its own benefit. And, you know, there's a, definitely a built-in motivation to do that. Um, so the hallmark that we usually associate with gerrymandering is bizarrely shaped districts. In the case of Gary Salamander, you see that in order to make a safe, um, he was actually part of the Republican Democratic Party or the Democrat Republican, I can't remember which order those go in. And in order to create a safe, safe district for his party in 1812, he like snaked around this whole area and created something that looked very much like a salamander. And it looked weird. And so people were like, well, why would you draw it like that unless you were trying to manipulate lines? And they were correct. Um, so this has been um, a problem for a very long time, um, and it was recently in the U.S. Supreme Court in the case Rucho versus Common Cause, um, which was challenging, um, sort of brought together a lot of cases, challenging partisan gerrymanders in different states. Um, turns out that the Supreme Court decided that partisan gerrymandering was actually beyond the reach of federal law, so there can be no further federal challenges to it at this time, but they did explicitly leave the door open for states to restrict it, okay?
Okay, so that was the gerrymandering in 1812. Why was this in the um, courts today? Well, it's still definitely a problem. So some of you may be very familiar with some of these pictures. Um, what do we see here? Um, on top, I, I, my last job before I came to Colorado College was in uh, Pennsylvania at Villanova, which is in the suburbs of Philadelphia out here. And so I'm very familiar with this, um, this district that was drawn here, Pennsylvania U.S. House District 7, otherwise known as Goofy Kicking Donald Duck. So over here you can see Philadelphia. Um, and then, uh, which is a heavily democratic um, area. And then here, what you see is a safe Republican district created by snaking through the suburbs of Philadelphia and avoiding some areas and picking up other areas to create um, a reasonably safe Republican district. Um, in two places where Goofy's head is attached and where his foot touches Donald Duck, this is actually... Um, a parking lot or a hospital that connects this district. If you removed those two items, it would fall apart into three pieces. Um, so it's a very carefully crafted district that was um, in act, that was used in, in 2012 um, after the 2011 redistricting process in Pennsylvania. Um, so this is a suspicious district. Um, you may recognize Thomas Hoffler on the left, who was the um, Republican Party's um, redistricting czar, let's say, their advisor. Um, and these, pan these maps that you see to the right of him are from his files, which his daughter released to the public after his death. Um, in the middle one here, you can see Texas State House districts. It's unclear what's going on when you first look at it, but what I want you to imagine is that right in the middle of all of those fingers coming in, all of those colors, that's the city of Austin that has been sort of carved up into swaths that contain urban area and a big piece of rural area that keeps them from being, um, keeps um, Democrats in this case, because this is a Republican drawn map, um, from getting too many seats in the Austin area. On the right, you see the North Carolina State House um, districts, a map that came out of Hoffler's files. And here's where you see that um, what you see in the picture here is not anything that indicates partisan um, affiliation, but this is actually racial data. This is the uh, voting age black population that is being depicted in those different um, colors depending on the concentration in each precinct. And so you can see that um, they're very interested in partisan issues and there is a strong overlap there with um, racial issues. And so this is actually um, has been taken as evidence of racial gerrymandering, which is illegal under federal law by the Voting Rights Act of 1965. So um, we definitely um, that you can see how there's a lot of uh, in all of the partisan and um, population data that we have and the ability of computers to um, create very data rich maps. Um, you can do a lot of nefarious and also a lot of good things with it, depending on what you're trying to do. Okay, so gerrymandering is very much still a problem. Why should we care? Well, I'll leave this up for you here, or in case you're looking away, maybe I could read a little part of it to you. Um, why should we care? Well, Justice Elena Kagan dissented from the Rucho versus Common Cause verdict, and she brought out a really important point here, which is that through partisan gerrymandering, it partisan gerrymandering can, quote, deprived citizens of the most fundamental of their constitutional rights, the rights to participate equally in the political process, to join with others, to advance political beliefs, and to choose their political representatives. So essentially, the point she's making here is that partisan gerrymandering is turning upside down the fundamental notion of democracy. We think that in a representative democracy, constituents choose their representatives. However, this is giving representatives the ability to essentially choose their own constituents, okay? which is not the way that we um, imagine democracy to work. Um, okay, so this has been a problem for a long time, and I would like to make the case that we should really care about it. Why should we care in particular right now? Well, I mean, in comparison to the past, I think it's there's a, a strong case to be made that partisan gerrymandering has become worse. Um, there's a lot of reasons for that. We might think of this as a matter of means, motive, and opportunity. So 
there's just better technology now than there ever has been, right? Um, geographic information systems and uh, the sort of amount of data that we have about how people vote and the sort of maps and analyses we're able to do, like way beyond now, way beyond what there was 10 years ago, 10 years ago um, and light years away from 10 years before that. And it has just gotten more and more advanced as time goes on. So the means of gerrymandering have gotten much better. Um, motive definitely always exists. Everybody has this motive to acquire more power for their party. Um, and in fact, there was a wave election in 2010 that brought a lot of Republicans into the um, state legislatures around the country. And this just happened, well, not happened through careful planning, actually, but it created an exceptional opportunity for gerrymandering in 2011 for the GOP. Again, I don't claim that this is a one-sided issue, that one party does this and the other party doesn't, but um, the cases that we're going to look at were exceptionally um, favorable to the GOP because of this wave election. Um, okay, so the other reason to care, besides the fact that things have gotten much more intense, is because we have a chance to do it differently. Of course, um, the, we have to redraw these boundaries um, to reflect the current population. And that population is measured by the government every 10 years in the census. And so after the 2020 census data comes in, we'll be redistricting in 2021. So across the country, there's a chance to do better. So what better reason to care? Okay, so how can we, um, please forgive my ridiculous uh, slide title, see they're just my own private amusement. Um, so how, why should we, or how can we fight this? Um, well, so in Colorado, we have a great example of this. So public awareness of the problem and disapproval can actually cause states to um, pass laws against partisan gerrymandering, which happened in Colorado. Um, in 2018, along with other states, Utah, Michigan, Arizona, Missouri. And all, this happened more than 10 years ago in California. So we sort of have some template to work from there. So one way that people try and fight this is by creating independent commissions and by explicitly outlawing partisan gerrymandering. Um, for, even in states where these measures haven't been taken, state Supreme Courts have also stepped in and they've used state laws and state constitutions to strike down um, gerrymanders. This happened in Pennsylvania in 2018 and in North Carolina in the 2019 after Rucho versus Common Cause came in and said that the federal government wasn't going to change it. The state government came in and, um, and changed the maps that were being challenged there. Um, so there are ways to fight this, and but they're going to have to happen on a state by state level. So, you know, grassroots uh, movement in every state to try and get this to change. Um, and what part, how in the world can we, you know, help this happen in a given state? Well, in each case, we're going to have to make the argument that a districting plan is biased. We have to make the argument that there is a problem. And so in order to do that, um, we need to quantify this somehow. We need to quantify partisan bias. Well, as soon as you quantify something, then I get really excited because that sounds like math. And we um, you know, get to, get to have a big math party with it, essentially. OK, so let's. how does this actually work? We want to quantify gerrymandering. We want to quantify partisan bias in a math. Well, we start with the first thing that we think of, the first thing that's associated with gerrymandering, which is weird shapes. Um, the gerrymander, gerrymandering gives us um, the, sorry, there's the eyeball test um, is what people have historically used to argue that a district is gerrymandered. Um, as it's for equal opportunity's sake, I put in this district, which we can see is really all over the place. This is Maryland's third congressional district. This was drawn by Democrats. So this is, um, if you believe this is a gerrymander, which the eyeball test would say it is, this is a democratic gerrymander. But the idea is that partisan manipulation can result in weird shapes, and indeed it can. Okay, so what is, the, you know, how, how do we go from there? Weird shapes are not something that's super easy to quantify. So to start talking about this, we often say that fair districts should be compact. They should be squished together somehow. You should not bypass close area in favor of far area, because why would you do that when you could, you know, get the population that you need um, by staying closer by? Um, but again, I just 
tried to become more technical, but I still didn't quantify compactness, right? I just sort of tried to define it a little better. Okay, but so how do we quantify that? Well, some states have done it in different ways. Um, minimum total perimeter is how Colorado does this or has done it in the past. Um, so the idea is that if you have less perimeter, then you have less room to sort of wiggle around all over the place in your boundary. And so you're going to have to keep your district more together. If you were feeling especially um, math inclined today, you may have been like, well, but wait a minute, shouldn't there be some involvement with the area that we're including? Um, because if you have big area, you're going to have big perimeter. Well, yes. So one way that people cover this is that for each district, perhaps you should have a low perimeter to area ratio. Okay. And this is um, this idea lets you sort of make the scale work with the um, scale of the district you're working on. Because, for example, if you're in a city, you're going to have you may have very small perimeter, um, but still snake around and pick up a lot of um, of population and be able to manipulate it the way you want. Whereas if you're out in rural areas, the scale is just so much larger that you um, might not be able to, um, you might get different amounts of perimeter for a very fair um, drawing. Um, people also do this with circles and think about how circles could contain a district and think about the area of those circles. But all of these have some problems as it turns out. I already got into the first problem, which is that problem of scale, right? Like if you're talking about minimum total perimeter, you can be as manipulative as you want in high density areas because that will not um, alter your total perimeter for the state that much. Whereas um, as long as you draw straight lines in those rural areas where like you're, you know, have districts that with boundaries that are hundreds of miles long. So the scale is a big deal there. Also, there's geography. In some cases, you might think that the best boundaries are natural boundaries. And so why not use a river as a boundary, right? But how does a river work? Well, it snakes all over the place and creates a wavy, like long distance boundary, okay? And so, so like geography might dictate boundaries which are actually kind of weird looking. Um, and then there's also the problem of measurement, right? So maybe you have heard of the coastline paradox. And the question is, what is the length of the coastline of England? And the answer is, it depends. It depends on what you use to measure it. Do you measure it with a yardstick? Do you measure it with a ruler? Do you measure it with a micrometer, right? Depending on how you do that, because of the sort of fractal nature of a coastline, it becomes more and more complicated as you zoom in, you're going to get um, a longer and longer coastline as you measure it more carefully. And so there's not one standard way to measure these boundaries even. Nobody really, can legislate that, or the, you know, maybe you could, but that's not what is, is legislated in general. Um, so there's, there's a lot of issues here um, when, you, when you try and get into like legislating and um, quantifying compactness. Um, and so these are all things that make it hard. And what the result is, is that you can actually kind of game this measure, right? Like you can create relatively compact districts by any of these measures, but still have your partisan, um, bias come be in work in the works but you also if you are just trying to draw good districts you might draw ugly ones that follow natural boundaries that will then get thrown out because they sort of go against some of these principles so maybe compactness is not even though it's intuitively um, a good way to identify gerrymanders maybe it's not a good way to actually quantify this okay so let's try it again how about proportionality so this is a big one that people talk about when they're pointing out that something is suspicious as a gerrymander. So in North Carolina, for example, um, this what we're looking at here is actually the 2016 North Carolina map. And the 2012 North Carolina map um, gave an outcome of 10 seats safe for, for Republicans and out of 13 total, even though Democrats received about half the vote statewide. Now that 2012 map, which I'll show you a little later, was actually thrown out um, for racial gerrymandering. Um, the Republican controlled state legislature redrew this map, which even though it actually looks relatively compact, it looks much more compact than the 2012 one did, did which I will show you again a little later. Um, even though it's more compact, it still had the exact same partisan outcome. 
10 out of 13 seats for Republicans, even though the vote was more like 50-50. Okay, so this is disproportional. The, purport, the proportion of seats that the party won is not anywhere close to the same as the proportion of the vote. And when this happens, people often say, wait a minute, this is a sign of partisan gerrymandering. Okay, so um, here's the problem. Disproportionate representation doesn't have to come from gerrymandering. It can just come from human geography. So this is Massachusetts is a great example of this phenomenon. Um, so Massachusetts has nine U.S. House seats, and they're mostly all represented by Democrats in general. In 2006, for example, which is the voting data that they used for this study, 30% of the votes for governor were cast for Republican. Um, but you got no um, Republican representatives from the whole state. So is this a result of partisan gerrymandering? Well, if you actually go through and you cherry pick the most Republican precincts um, from the whole state, because precincts are like the smallest level at which we have voting data. So this is sort of, you know, the, the smallest unit that we could put together to make districts that we could understand how they would have voted. If you go through the whole state and pick the most Republican leaning districts until you get or precincts, until you get enough population for a district, that district will still not be majority Republican. So there's, in fact, no possible way to combine the precincts in um, Massachusetts, even if you throw out the possibility of or the requirement that they're contiguous, that they're one piece. There's no way to draw a Republican leading district. And here's why. Here's, here's one way to think about that. You might be like, why? That doesn't even make sense. The idea is that the Republicans are so spread out through the landscape of Democrats that there are just not enough density of them in any one place to actually create a district that's going to be majority Republican. So, for example, you might imagine that we have a state where every household of five people, say, has three Democrats and two Republicans. Since you can't cut households in drawing boundaries, there's no way that you could ever have an outcome of a district any different than a three to two ratio of Democrats and Republicans. And that's basically what's going on in Massachusetts is that people are just so just well distributed across the landscape that you can't get a majority for the Republican party in this state. Um, okay, so those two ideas of uh, compactness and proportionality have sort of failed us, unfortunately. Um, there are other mathy ideas which are interesting in their own ways. <coughs> Excuse me. The efficiency gap is one of them. You can kind of see it faintly in the background here. I just put it in the background very faintly because I didn't want to um, get too caught up in explaining it. But it's basically a measure of like which party is wasting more votes across a whole map. And another measure is the mean median score, which is sort of a measure of partisan symmetry. Like if party A gets 45% of the vote, do they have the same outcome as party B would be get if they had 45% of the vote? So these are both sort of nice mathematical ideas, but both of them have the same problems of some of the things that we've already seen. And the main problem is context. How do we know what actually would make sense for a state if you drew the maps without partisan bias, because every state is different and has quirks of human and physical geography that make a different range of outcomes normal for that state. So if you're going to try and measure this partisan bias in any way, you sort of have to know what's normal for the state and like figure out what the context is that you should be judging it in. <clears throat> okay, one second, let me just have a drink of water here. All right. Okay, so that's the big mathematical idea I want to bring to you, which is that we're going to put a map in context using something called ensemble analysis. Here's the big idea. It goes back to 2013, and this is a paper from Jonathan Mattingly, who's a professor at Duke and his undergraduate summer research student. So I teach at an undergraduate institution. Um, and I tell my students this all the time that see undergraduates can do amazing work. Um, and I think that this area has actually been a really great example of that in many ways. A lot of the work that um, I've done has been with undergraduate students 
And they have been involved in a lot of national efforts on this too, because this is a very difficult problem that involves a lot of data. And you need a lot of people to be involved in order to um, actually carry this process out. So undergraduates have done a lot. Um, but the main idea is that you create an ensemble, is what we call it, which is basically a set of thousands, um, hundreds of thousands, maybe millions of random maps um, that would be valid for a state and they give, so they're viable in that they are contiguous and they give equal population and you can try and make them good in various ways as we'll discuss later. But the idea is you create a whole bunch of maps that are randomly created and don't include any partisan information in their drawing. Then we incorporate real voting data from actual elections and we determine what the outcome of the election would have been with those random district lines. And we say, okay, with these random district lines, we maybe would have gotten three seats for party A and you know, four seats for party B. And we do this for every single map. And then to keep track of all of those outcomes, we make a histogram, so basically a bar chart of how often different things happen. And this really creates this beautiful picture of what's likely to happen if you draw maps without partisan bias. And now the idea is not that any of the maps that we've created, we're not, we don't think that those are like the best maps necessarily, but we've now created sort of profile of what's normal, right? And if somebody has drawn a map and we can calculate what its outcome would have been under the same uh, election data that we used for the others, if that outcome is an outlier, if it's far from normal, then probably this map has not come from a world without partisan bias. Probably it's the result of gerrymandering. And even if it's not, even if we can't like prove intent, we can definitely say that it's not representative of common usual maps drawn without partisan bias for this area. So you can at least use this to make the argument that it's a sort of bad non-representative map for the state. So that's a big idea. Um, let me just ask if there are any questions at this moment. I'll have some examples for you in a minute, but is there anything that is um, driving anybody crazy right now? All right, let's see this in action. Okay, so here's a time for an activity. Um, so redistricting orange pink land. We've got a 10 by 10 grid, it's 40% orange voters. Um, let me see, now I believe that this was shared with you ahead of time. Did anybody try redistricting this land ahead of time? The idea is that we're gonna make 10 districts, each of which should have 10 households in it. Um, has anybody tried this for themselves? Oh, wonderful. Okay. What, how did, so first of all, you might think, I'll ask you this question. You might think that since there's 40% orange voters, you might think that they, there should be 40% orange seats. And you might think that you, you know, if you don't have any bias, you should end up with four orange seats out of 10. Now, who, um, who had four, did any, how, who got any number of seats here? What, what were your outcomes? I've forgotten exactly, but it was not the orange did not get 40% of the seats. I think, they okay, got that's three. Great. I think they may have gotten three, two or three. Two or three. I, did, I just made everything compact. I, I, I divided the uh, 10 by 10 into 10 districts that were very compact. Maybe what you did was something like this. Yes, exactly. <laughs> Is that very similar to what you did? That's exactly what I did. Oh, great. Okay. So, so this is a, if you're trying to draw things as simply as possible, like straight lines are a great idea. <clears throat> In fact, we can see that straight lines won't always work for um, actual populations because of the complicated ways that people live. Because, you know, you're going to have to have much smaller districts in Denver versus out in the western slope of Colorado, right? Because just to gather the right amount of uh, population. But in this particular case, you can just draw a nice grid and be like, there's our districts, we're done. Um, and so if you draw a grid like this and you ask your, and you say, okay, I'm going to count up the number of pink and orange in each um, square, what you'll see is that you get two and a half seats for orange. It's like you get two safe districts for orange and then one that's 50-50. Um, so that is one way to do it. Now, you, so you might think, okay, well, that, is, that must be the fair outcome, right? Well, if you just turn your <clears throat> squares the other way, then you might think this is also a fair outcome. Well, this is 1.5 seats for orange. That's basically three toss-up districts, no safe districts. 
Okay. So this is, these are like two extremely fair looking plans that give different outcomes, but you know, maybe either one is fair. It's just, you know, there's maybe there's a lot of different things that could be fair. Well, if we tried to actually get proportionality, we would have to draw our boundaries a little funky. And if you put some time into it and, you know, sit down with a cup of coffee, you can end up with four seats for orange. Okay. When you draw it like this, which is what we think of as proportional. Um, well, maybe we have an orange controlled state legislature and orange gets a little greedy and they want to see how well they can do for themselves. Well, if we draw it like this, and there's other ways to do it too, but this is one way, you can actually get six seats for orange. Um, it turns out six is, you can tell for sure that six is as well as you can do because um, there's only 40 seats and you need six that are orange, or sorry, 40 households that are orange, and you need six of them to make a majority in a seat. And so once you've made six majority orange seats, you don't have enough left over to do anything else. So you can tell that this is actually as well as you could do. Okay, so you can actually get up to six seats for orange, even though they only get 40% of the vote. Um, what are the signatures of this successful gerrymander for orange? Well, we see cracking, which is where we have taken pink voters and cracked them into many districts as large minorities. So they're still not in the majority in these districts, but they've sort of been broken up safely um, and had those voters spread among safe orange districts. The other hallmark that we can see here is packing. Right? We have several districts which are extremely um, pink. Oops, sorry about that. Let me go back down here. Yep, so cracking and packing. Okay, so these are all different outcomes that could have occurred if you drew lines here. Um, we could just sit around and draw lines all day and start to get a sense for what's normal when we draw without bias. It takes a few minutes to draw one of these, right? And like, how many few minutes do you want to spend on this to get a sense of what's normal? So what we're going to do is actually do an experiment. We're going to produce 300, or excuse me, 33,333 random districting plans and see how many orange seats turn up in each. Well, with the magic of computers, we can do that in moments, right? And what we see is a histogram that kind of looks like this. All right, well, I'm going to run it a couple more times just to make sure that that experiment wasn't weird. So there's three different experiments that I've run for a total of like 100,000 plans. And what do we see? Well, we see that in every case, we have you know, basically the same shape of histogram coming out, which means that probably it wasn't something about each particular experiment that we're seeing. We're probably seeing something about the underlying map. Because the, if we do this randomness three times and get essentially the same outcome every time, probably we're doing enough samples where we're starting to see a good picture of what's possible for the actual space. Um, what else do we see? Well, there's our, if we think about what's likely to happen, we can see that there's a range of things that are likely to happen. Um, getting 1.5 seats is not, not the most common outcome, but not super unlikely. Whereas getting six seats is way out there. Like this just does not happen with random maps in general. Like maybe there's a couple maps that do this, but it's very unusual for this, um, for this, um, for this vote distribution. Okay, so what do we learn from this? Well, first of all, the thing to notice is that there's a range of outcomes that happen when you draw the plans without bias. And, you know, like there, I think what this really points out to me is that there, if we, if we can't expect proportionality, which we in general, by um, federal law, we are not um, allowed to expect proportionality. Um, and we have seen reasons why proportionality fails, even when you're drawing unbiased maps. And so it's probably unrealistic to expect proportionality. Um, range of things that are fair with these um, randomly drawn maps. The most likely outcome is 2.5 seats, which again is not proportional to the vote. The plan with 1.5 seats is reasonable in that it's like in the fat part of the bell curve here. Um, it's not right in the middle, but it's definitely not an outlier. Whereas that plan with six seats, we can see that there's something weird going on there. It's very unlikely to have been created without partisan bias. So perhaps a better explanation is what we know is true, that we intentionally drew that to favor orange as much as possible. Um, so this is ensemble analysis, and this is how it works. 
what's going on under the hood? Well, I, bear with me for a moment. I will try and keep the math like not too long and absorbing. Hey, but, Beth, Beth, can I yeah. ask a question before you go on? Yeah, sure. Let me go back to that last slide. So it's, it's so counterintuitive that the proportional result is so unlikely. Yeah. Um, can, can you, are you able to kind of look at this, this map and give us sort of an arm waving or a set of arm waving reasons for, for why that is in this case? Yeah, well, one, one way you can think about this is like, what would it mean? How would you get proportional representation? So let's start with the, the idea that we had originally that every, or like go back to the Massachusetts idea and imagine, do a thought experiment like the one that we did there, which is saying that I've got um, this population which votes, you know, maybe there's some narrow majority for party A, okay? But if party A and party B are spread out evenly across the landscape, then any way to draw a district will essentially give you a majority party A district. And so even by having a very narrow majority, when you cut up the landscape, it becomes much easier to draw a district that lets that majority win than it is to draw a district that lets the minority party win. Yeah, right, okay. Yeah, so the idea is that there's sort of a natural built-in winner's bonus for anyone right. who has a small majority. And um, you can, it's sort of counterintuitive it's often thought that it's hard that like some that like people who are if one party is dense in an area that party is packing themselves and they're giving themselves a disadvantage on the other hand you can also take the idea to be that well if we had um both parties or all the parties perfectly packed so they were like completely separated then it would be easy to actually get a proportional vote by just making districts that were 100 percent one party that lined up perfectly with the proportion of the vote for each party sure uh, which is like probably not a good idea for lots of reasons given the level of polarization that would have to occur in order for that to happen like that i'm not saying that's a good idea but in some sense like this um the more evenly voters are distributed, the more this winner's bonus really shows itself. Thank you. Cool. Yeah, I think, I think the reason, well, yeah, I think the reason this seems counterintuitive, it doesn't seem it now, but it, it, it seemed counterintuitive, I think, because I'm forgetting that you, you only get a point when you, when you win or tie a district. Yeah. Uh, you don't get proportional points. Yep. And this is part of this single member geographic thing. Like this is just sort of deeply built into the fact that we have these single member districts and it's like winner take all in that district. Yeah. So it, it's at this point baked into the, to the pie that um, if you, yeah, if you have a narrow majority, you get it all. Right, thank you. Yeah, no problem. Thanks for your question. Um, okay, so how are we doing this? Um, let me just, so that, that idea was very much the important idea, but I want to show you a couple cool things about how it actually happens. So in orange pink land, we might be able to sit down and actually just like flip coins all day. And, you know, in a couple of years, we would have been able to actually come up with like that, that um, histogram that we did. However, in um, a larger case, in a realistic size case, we need to do some fairly um, thoughtful math in order to be able to actually make these random maps. So the kind of process we use is called a Markov chain Monte Carlo process. It just means that it's a random, it's a sort of randomness um, that starts at one map and then a random process is applied and takes it to another map. And then we forget what happened before and we apply another random process to take it to another map. The idea is that we sort of use this to kind of walk around on the space of possible maps, like forgetting where we've been before. This is called a random walk. And the particular kind of steps we take in our walk that go from random map to random map, in this case, are um, dictated by a method called recom. And the idea here is this was devised by Moon Duchin, who I mentioned earlier, and her collaborators at the Metric Geometry and Gerrymandering Group, Daryl DeFord and Dustin, or Justin Solomon. Um, the idea with this way of getting randomness is you take two districts, you put them together, and then you um, com combine them into a mega district, and then you randomly kind of cut it in half. 
So you can see the top left districts here have been changed, um, and this would be what's called a recom step in our, in our way of getting randomness. Um, so when you're thinking about this random walk, you can actually think about this spatially. You could imagine making the space of all possible districting plans and then connecting them when there's like a random step that could take you from one to another. And I, I show you, this is called the metagraph. And I show you here what a metagraph for three, a three by three grid with three districts looks like. It's not that bad. It's only 10, 10 possibilities. So like, that's not, that's not so bad, right? Well, it blows up, as it turns out, the more complicated the graph gets. So here on the right, you see what happens when you have four by four grid that you want to divide into four districts. There's already something like um, nearly 200 different possibilities there just for a four by four grid. And you can see how complicated the connections between them are. When you do a nine by nine grid and you want to divide it into nine districts, that there's already 700 trillion districts that are possible or 700 trillion plans that are possible completely impossible to see all of them and figure out what's going on. Um, a 10 by 10 grid, like the one we just saw, there, nobody knows how many districting plans are. We know there's more than 700 trillion, but like it's mind-blowingly huge. Like it's impossible to run over all the possibilities. And so that's why we use this random process because we need to sample. We can't possibly look at all of them, but we can get what we hope is a random sample that represents what is possible for the state. Okay, so how does this really happen step by step? Well, there you can see um, it, the, the idea here is, yeah, you can put together those two plans, break them up, do it again. And as you keep moving through that, you will eventually change the whole map and you can like really wander very far from where you originally started. So when you do it, um, you actually use something called graph theory. So you combine your regions and then you create what's called a precinct graph or a dual graph. And it's like you put a dot for every household or region and a little line when they're connected by a boundary. And this is what's called an adjacency graph for those precincts. Then you find a simpler graph called a spanning tree inside that and you use randomness to do that. That's where the randomness comes in. And then you use further randomness to try and find a place to cut it so that you have equal areas. Then you split it into two regions. And you do this over and over and over again. And you, by doing that, slowly change the whole map. Okay, so that's a 10 by 10 grid, or I think I took it down to a five by five grid for that last example. Here's what we're dealing with in real life. This is the adjacency graph for all of the precincts in Colorado. Um, and you can see that um, there's some interesting precincts. Hinsdale County, for example, 864 people at the last census, a single precinct. Whereas if we look over here in Denver, there's going to be a lot more precincts. Um, each precinct has something like 1,000 to 2,000 voters in it. Um, they're not strictly based on population, they're based on the voters. Um, okay, so this is the kind of graph we're working with in real life. And so this really brings out how complicated the space of possibilities is and how hard we have to work to get a good sample of what's possible. Okay, so let me just tell you quickly how this has shown up in real life in um, a couple of other settings. So North Carolina, I already showed you this map earlier on. This is a, I like to use this example because it's a completely open, open partisan gerrymander. Like the people who drew it said that they did it on purpose because they couldn't get any, ten, they got 10 seats for Republicans because they couldn't get 11. You know, this was like their, their stated purpose, which is like, I think, a more noble um, way of coming at this than you could in some other ways, right? Like they're just admitting that they think this is what's best for their state, so they're doing it. Um, okay, so the 2012 plan was struck down, as I mentioned. Um, 2012 plan, you can see it on the top left here. It was a mess of snaky districts and crazy, um, crazy shapes going on. And it had that outcome of 10 uh, Republican districts out of 13. The 2016 map, which was drawn by the North Carolina State Legislature, looks much better, but has the same outcome, okay? At the same time that they were adopting this 2016 plan in the state legislature, there's a plan over here on the right that was drawn by a bipartisan group of judges. And this was sort of their best attempt at coming, at like saying what would be possible with a nonpartisan process. Okay, so um, Jonathan Mattingly, which uh, you'll see a picture of him on the next slide, actually ran this analysis, this ensemble analysis, with thousands of maps for North Carolina. And these are the histograms that he made. Um, what you see are 
that in both cases, in the left hand, we're using 2012 votes, and on the right hand, we're using votes from 2016. You get different outcomes in those two cases because those were very different elections, right? One was more Democratic favoring, one was more Republican favoring. Um, but in both cases, you have sort of the same behavior. The North Carolina maps, the 2012 and 2016 maps, are very, very much at the edge of the bell curve. They're not in the thick part of the bell curve that has a high probability of occurring without partisan bias. Whereas the judges' plans are in the thick part of the bell curve. They're not necessarily the most common, but it is still in the range of like things that happen without partisan bias. So this analysis was actually part of the case Rucho versus Common Cause that was um, before the Supreme Court and decided in 2019 that it was not justiciable. Um, okay, so uh, Jonathan Mattingly, um, mathematician, probably did not picture himself as an um, expert witness, actually became a big part of this case with his work. Um, so we know now that the um, Rucho versus, versus Common Cause was uh, decided that it was not um, going to that this question, partisan gerrymandering was not going to be a question that could be decided by federal courts. Um, but in fact, they did throw this map out in state court in 2019. And so the, um, the arguments that Mattingly made were successful in a state court setting to argue that these maps were uh, biased in an egregious way. In Pennsylvania, the, doofy, the goofy <laughs> kicking Donald Duck map, this was also thrown out by the Pennsylvania State Supreme Court. And um, again, the state legislature needed to draw new maps. What you see here are on the top, let's see here. Yeah, okay, so on, in the middle, what you see is the original goofy kicking, or kicking Donald Duck plan. On the top, what you see is a plan that was drawn by state senators as a candidate to replace it. And on the bottom, you see a plan that was drawn by the governor's office, the governor's plan. Now, what we see on this, in these histograms is not the same. It's not just seat share that we see in the histograms this time. This is in fact a mean median measure. That's that partisan symmetry measure that I um, talked about before. So I like to include this because you don't have to just use seat share. You can use other measures um, that would you know, maybe be useful to you for whatever reason. When you make histograms with mean median, what you see again is that the original plan and its proposed replacement are way out of the thick part of the bell curve. The governor's plan was not in the middle, but at least it was in the thick part of the bell curve. And so what happened is that the governor called in Moon Duchin to help him evaluate these plans and decide whether the one drawn by the state uh, legislature was acceptable. With this analysis, he decided it wasn't acceptable, and then the state legislature would not accept his plan. So they actually had to have Stanford um, professor Nathaniel personally draw the maps. He turns out to be the person who just draws the maps when nobody can decide in many different states. And so um, they, they actually brought in and this, they had this map drawn for them. Um, basically just using the principles that were laid out in their state constitution, which included compactness and keeping counties together. So this stuff has been a big deal in court cases and public, um, like things of great public interest. I'll just very quickly show you a case in the Virginia House of Delegates. Um, the Virginia House of Delegates, I think 33 of their districts were thrown out for um, racial gerrymandering. And so here is just a slightly different picture that you can make using the technology that I've showed you so far. What you see here are those 33 districts. Um, when we take that region that covered those 33 districts and basically run this um, method of combining, recombining districts and generating random maps on that, and we make you know a million maps that way, what we can do is in the case of each map, we can sort them from like um, most something to least something. In this case, what we're, case, what we're gonna talk about is black voting age population. We sort those 33 districts from smallest proportion of black voting age voters to um, largest uh, proportion of black voting age population. And when we do that, we can make a sort of picture of what's likely to happen in each of those districts as they're ordered. So that, this is what's called a box plot. The idea is that the thick box contains the middle 50% of what happened, and then the arrows go out to 99% of the maps that were drawn, or the little, the whiskers. So what we can see here is that in the original plan, the enacted plan is the in red here. 
what we see is that in these 33 districts, we've got the red dots way below the mean or way below the boxes even for this, um, these districts, and then way above the boxes in here and up into this area. So what is this that we're seeing? What is this a signature of? Well, this is a signature of cracking and packing, right? What we're seeing here is that the crucial window that they say creates an opportunity district um, under the Voting Rights Act is about 37 to 55% of the population um, being uh, black voting age, uh, of the voting age population is black. And what we see is that where there was decided to create an opportunity district, the um, districts were packed to be at the very upper end of that window, right? And what that meant is removing population from these districts here and creating many districts down here, which could have possibly been put into this range, right, without too much trouble, but were definitely intentionally kept down outside of the range. And so this is part of the hallmark that you see um, that made the argument that that was um, racial gerrymandering. What you see here are how some other plans compare to those. Okay, so you can use this technique to talk about a lot of different things. Um, okay, so I'll just briefly talk about what I've, my group has done here in Colorado. Um, so in, the, in this context, let me just say, like, you could do this analysis for yourself anywhere. It's sort of a state-by-state state do-it-yourself thing. What are the ingredients that you would need and that my group needed to do this? Well, first off, you need to have a very accurate um, GIS shape file of all the voting precincts. You need that because you need to be able to create that graph that shows how the precincts are connected to each other. You're going to need population data from the census. You're going to need precinct level voting data from the elections. And you're going to need some computer code to run this Markov chain Monte Carlo process. And then finally, when you're done with all that, you need some statistical skills to like talk a little bit about what's going on. So in Colorado, this is what we see. Um, here's a map of Colorado. Many audiences, I have to explain a little bit about where the population is. You probably all know where the people live in Colorado. And so it's no surprise that our voting districts, our, our current house districts look like this. Very small near Denver, um, larger as we go out, really large on the western slope and the eastern plains. Um, so we are, this is the team that studies Colorado. Um, so who are all these people? So across the bottom here, you see Jen Cleland, who's a professor at UC Boulder. Haley Colgate, who is a, was an undergraduate student who worked with me at Colorado College and is now a graduate student at the University of Wisconsin. Daryl DeFord, um, formerly a postdoc at MIT, now a professor at Washington State. It's me. And then Flavia Sancier Barbosa, who's a professor of statistics at Colorado College. We are the ones who are writing the paper, who have written a paper about this, but it actually builds on the work of a ton of other people, including this large team. There's actually two teams of undergraduates here that you can see um, that were a big part of this research. And we also had help from the Metric Geometry and Gerrymandering Group and the Voting Rights Data Institute, um, as well as tons of people across the state just who were willing to share their work with us. So our project is to basically apply this technique to Colorado. Uh, we want to do this to understand whether there has been partisan gerrymandering in the past. So looking at the most recently enacted maps. And we'd also like to really bring this tool into the conversation for the 2021 redistricting process, right? Like we want people to be understanding how this can help them evaluate the maps that are put forward by the independent commissions. Um, so why Colorado? Well, first of all, we all live here, except all of us except for Daryl. Um, and also because amendments Y and Z make this a national priority, right? This is one of the first places since this technique of ensemble analysis has been devised. It's one of the first places where there have been opportunities for like public input into the maps and for ways that people can actually get involved and use ensemble analysis to influence the process. So um, as Chauncey mentioned, the amendments Y and Z create independent redistricting commissions and there's a huge public involvement process. It outlaws partisan bias and you can't consider incumbency either, which is a big gerrymandering um, trigger right there. People do not wanna lose their own seats. Requires preserving political boundaries, so county and city boundaries, and also communities of interest, which are you know a lot more, um, uh, 
a lot less defined. Think we could all be parts of many communities of interest. It also requires maximizing the number of competitive districts. So between the public input out pro or input process that exists and the fact that there's so many different criteria for fairness, we really um, wanted to compare those different fairness criteria and um, really get involved in this public process. Okay, so here's what Colorado looks like by voting precinct. If you wanted to see a picture, a little better illustration of those precincts and how they're connected. Okay, so how do we actually make that map? Well, it turned out it was a hard process. So um, those maps, when we come up with a precinct map, we use the precincts again because those are the sort of smallest level at which voting counts are available. And so those are our building blocks. But the precincts aren't managed by the state. As it turns out, the precincts are managed county by county. There's 64 counties in Colorado, so that means 64 different people managing the precinct maps for those places. So when we're getting precinct maps, what you do is call up Crowley County in this example, and then they send you a map that looks like this. And then you go, have to go through and turn that into a GIS uh, shape file and then fit it together with the shape files that you have for other counties. Um, this is an incredibly laborious process. There's something like 3000 precincts over the course of these 64 files. So this is an enormous undertaking. Um, luckily, we had a large team. Um, here's Haley Colgate, who I mentioned, Austin Aidy, who is this CC alum who came to help us. Caden Mengelik and Edward Santos Vega were also helpful on this project. Um, the, there was a lucky break for these guys. Um, it turns out that a guy named Todd Bleese at the um, demography office had actually um, surveyed the counties in spring 2018 to get boundaries. And so we used his file and then just updated it for fall 2018, um, especially using the, um, it, it needed updates, especially in very populous areas um, where the population had changed a lot and quickly. Um, okay, so they put together this map and it took months to do it, like really months. Um, now, once we have the precinct map, we have all the geographic map or information about the precinct. So for example, if we make a you know, random plan out of uh, precincts, we can now figure out like what the perimeter is if we wanted to understand one of those definitions of compactness. Um, now we have to load the population data, which we get from the census, but this is kind of a mess because we, well, so the reason we need this is because the districts have to have equal population, but the census blocks, which for example, you might see one of those in orange here, don't necessarily play well with the precinct boundaries, which you see in like dark gray. So if your census blocks and your precinct boundaries don't align, then you're going to have to, we, you have to do some work on that. It turned out what we ended up doing was like just assigning the population wherever the centroid of the um, district of the block was. Okay, so once we put in population data, we get the voting data. I'll just throw this up here so you can take a quick look at this. One thing to notice is that we actually use statewide elections instead of using U.S. House elections. The reason for that is because, you know, what's the best way to get elected to the House? To be already elected to the House. Um, incumbency effects are real and vary across the state. And so in order to have a set of votes that make sense with the uh, statewide uh, maps, we want to go ahead and use statewide elections. So three that we used were governor, secretary of state, and state treasurer. Um, okay, so now we have this, this very data rich object and we basically run that process that I showed you in orange pink land on it. So um, we did a couple tweaks though that I'll just tell you very quickly. I don't wanna take up much more of your time here. Um, so when we did the process in orange pink land, what we were finding were valid um, districts that had equal population and were contiguous, but they didn't necessarily like satisfy any of the other fairness rules, right? So what we sought to do in our analysis in some kind of new and creative ways was try and come up with a realistic sample space, like come up with some actual realistic maps so that we could get a better idea of what was possible using those. So what kinds of things did we want to do? Well, we wanted to keep the districts kind of compact. Even if that's like not always the best measure, this, the law requires it. So we try, we wanted compact districts. We wanted to keep counties and cities whole. We, and we wanted to preserve communities of interest. So we put a little effort into this and I'll just show you quickly how those ideas worked out. So it turns out that compactness is a type of um, randomness that we chose to incorporate, which is um, 
this recom, it turns out that that um, way of, of creating random maps actually kind of naturally creates compact ones, which is great. So to see how this works, you can say that in Colorado, compactness used to be measured by total perimeter. The old methods of doing this um, randomness were you would like flip one precinct from district to district, and you'd end up with a picture like what you see in the middle here with really weird, snaky, crazy districts. They're random, but they're not realistic. The method that we chose, Recom, actually creates much more compact kind of clumpy districts um, with a lot fewer steps. And so, in fact, it, that turned out to be um, to give us compactness without really very much trouble. The level of uh, compactness as measured by perimeter turned out to be very similar to what we saw in human drawn maps. There's mathematical reasons for this. I won't dig into that too much. Um, but if you're interested in hearing about those a little bit later, they have to do with the number of spanning trees. Okay, so to preserve counties, we also brought in a, new, a nice mathematical idea. The idea is that instead of making all of the edges equally likely to be chosen in those spanning trees, we could put some weights on the edges inside a county and make them more likely to be chosen. And so what this did was sort of create spanning trees that keep the counties together. And so then when we cut them, we're very likely to keep counties together. So depending on the weighting parameter that you use, you could in fact, like if you use no weighting parameter, you're gonna on average break about 23 counties. But if you, you can include a weighting parameter and break on average about eight counties, which is what our actual enacted map does, which is kind of cool. So this is a big deal. This is the first um, analysis that's used this. Um, another thing that we brought in that was really important was um, actually some careful statistics. Like, how do you know how many maps you really need? Well, it turns out this is why it's great to have a statistician on board. We brought in something called the KS statistic. And the idea is that we would fig like take a sample and see how big we have to expect that sample to be before two different samples with different starting points really start to look the same, which is what we see over here. And so this is the, this, we're the first group that's managed to bring this in, and I'm really proud of this work um, here. But we decided on a sample size of about 2 million and, and that to get the level of, um, of identicalness that we wanted. So finally, this is the end. Um, wait, I'll finally tell you what we've learned in Colorado. So as a little bit of a setup, Colorado, as we know, is often called a purple state, but it has sort of been seen, seen to swing more blue lately. Since seven representatives to the U.S. House, which we assume we'll get another one after the next census, and the current delegation is four Democrats, three Republicans. Now, I don't know how many of you were following the redistricting in 2011, but it was um, very contentious. It was decided in the court in the end because the, uh, they couldn't agree on a plan, and the plan that was actually chosen by the court was drawn by Democrats, and people were mad. So <clears throat> we wanted to be able to answer the question, like, was this an effective partisan gerrymander? We can't say anything about intention, but we definitely can say something about outcome here. Was this like actually successful as a gerrymander if it was? So we generated a lot of maps. Here's examples of what we generated for the US House. Um, I could have shown you about 300 of those. I love showing you those pictures. I'll just go back for a second and show them again. They're very pretty. Um, anyway, we created 2 million of those. And when you use, or I guess here, this histogram uses 2.2 million. Um, when you do that, these are the outcomes that you see. Um, in the most common outcome is that you have four Democratic seats. So that's exactly what happened, and that's what the purple line says here. Also, a reasonable outcome would be three Democratic seats, much less likely, but still reasonable is five. Um, six or two, pretty unlikely. Those I would qualify as outliers in this space, okay? So what we see is that the, um, if you use the treasurer's data and run our, um, and see who would have won in each district using the treasurer's data, then you get the outcome that did actually occur with the um, house race, which is four democratic seats. And it's totally, totally normal for the state. So boring histogram, uh, we don't see any evidence of partisan, effective partisan gerrymandering. Okay, so our next project, which is not going to be in our newest paper, but will be in the next one, is looking at Colorado's state house. 65 districts, also an extremely contentious 2011 redistricting. Okay, and again, the court had to um, be involved in this. So if we look at what happened here, um, I'll just give you some preliminary results, hot off the presses. How does it look? Well, here's some random state house maps that you might 
end up with, which again, very beautiful. Um, but in the end, here, this is only 50,000 steps. It's not nearly as big as our other one. But these preliminary results indicate that, again, 41 is the number of Democrats that are actually in the House. And this is, you know, in, our, in this case, it's the most likely outcome. So again, no evidence of effective partisan gerrymandering here. Okay, so where are we today? There's not really any evidence that we have effective partisan gerrymandering in, those, um, in 2011 in Colorado. Um, our group is gonna be, look, has done some interesting work with looking at how competitiveness compares to other criteria. Um, we're, we're working on creating better runs for the State House and the State Senate. And then a big part of what we're working on right now is doing exactly what I'm doing right now, building connections with the community and with um, groups like the League of Women Voters and the Legislative Council who will actually be drawing those maps. Um, another thing I like to, I have to do as I say this is, if you haven't filled out the census, please fill out the census. Um, because all of this really depends on that census data in a very serious way. Um, I really want to know what we can expect. As soon as we get the 2020 census data, we'll be running an analysis to see what we can expect with eight seats. And um, I'll be happy to share that with you when that comes out. All right, so thanks so much for your time. Um, if you want to draw some maps, you can use the same data that we drew. Oh, sorry, wait, this is a different call. If you want to draw the maps for Colorado, if you want to be the person who actually decides what's fair for Colorado, apply to be on the redistricting commissions. There's two of them, one for the state legislature and one for the U.S. House. Applications are due November 10th, and you can go to this website right here, which I think maybe we'll see in a minute um, to do that. If you want to draw your own plans and take them to the public hearings, you can use our data to do it. Um, our data is uploaded at districter.org, and it's also available from the Princeton Gerrymandering Project at um, gerrymander.princeton.edu. You can find out a lot more about math and gerrymandering with the Metric Geometry and Gerrymandering Group. And please, if you're interested, reach out to me with your questions. I would love to talk with you about this, or if you know um, another group that would like to hear about this kind of stuff, you know, please, um, don't hesitate to write me an email. And of course, just in case, you know, you know where to register to vote. <laughs> All right, thanks so much. Thank you, thank you so much for that talk. That was excellent. Beth, I have a question. Um, yeah. There wasn't a lot of talk about actual political party affiliations. And I know it's like, independents are around 40 percent then democrats and then republicans yep. is that entered into it in any way or is that yeah. too big so the that's a great question like how do you decide how these votes would come out some people could um you might think originally the thing to do would be to just look at people who are registered with one of the parties and register their vote for that party right but since we do have such a high um, percentage of unaffiliated voters, that's not really um, gonna be that useful. That's gonna eliminate about 40% of the voters. And um, also we know that not everybody votes their own party all the time, right? So it would be inaccurate in that way too. So for our um, outcomes, we use just voting data, no registration data. So we like assume that in that election, if um, this unaffiliated voter maybe voted for a Republican for state treasurer, in that model, we end up using the Republican vote for our House um, competitions as well. Um, we feel like this actually worked out pretty well in our case because the outcomes that we saw from the statewide elections were in every case the same as the outcomes that we saw when we actually looked at the state house, or excuse me, the US House districts. So we think it was a pretty good proxy in this case. Um, people do use the registration data in different ways of measuring competitiveness. And that's a really important question because state law doesn't actually say how we're supposed to measure competitiveness. And so one way that people do that is by saying, okay, well, a district is competitive if the balance of um, registered voters is about even between Democratic, Republican, and unaffiliated, or if there's a large unaffiliated block, people, some people have made the argument that that shows that the district is competitive. Um, but we have different, I, yeah, there's lots of different ideas on ways to measure that, so. Cool, thank you. Yeah. Um, other questions? I think you got everybody's head spinning. Oh gosh, okay. <laughs> um, yeah, um, I, okay, I see one in the chat here. So do district plans help perpetuate the two-party system? 
I wanted to create a moderate party or a genuinely liberal party with, uh, oh, if, if one created these, would these plans help? Um, yes, yeah, so this is interesting. The, the models that, I, that we've used are very much about two parties. It wouldn't necessarily have to be two parties. If there were a third party you could, that got a significant number of votes, you could certainly count up how many vote or how many uh, seats each of those parties would win. Um, the reason that we do a two-party model for our particular um, model is because that's just sort of how the actual system has worked, is that it, in almost every case, the um, large no largest numbers of votes are for those two parties. And so those are the people who are actually likely to win the election. Now, I think that your question might be a more philosophical one, which is, do yeah, like, does this system of single me member districts perpetuate the two-party system? Yes, 100% yes, because you, like the fact that you don't get proportional representation if you don't get the, like that the system isn't even built to create proportional representation, take like really disincentivizes voting for um, parties that don't have a chance to actually get a majority in your district or a plurality at least in your district. And so I, I think 100% yes, the way that we set up these districts motivates um, a dominant two-party system. Now, again, I don't know what to do about that, but it, it's sort of baked into this single-member ge geographic district. Does anybody have good ideas about what else to, about how to fix it? I don't know. Bring choice voting, yes! Yes, I teach math and social choice, um, which is a class about voting mostly. And I spend a lot of time talking about different ways of, you know, why don't we rank our votes? Um, and the League of Women Voters, which is a group that I'm affiliated with, has definitely been um, really pushing for ranked choice voting. So I think it's, I don't think it's insane that we would see that. Um, as long as we have these single member districts, you may still see dominance among the top parties, but if we had ranked choice voting, it would at least let, allow us to know in a much more real way, like what people's first preference was. My uh, pet theory is we go to a lottery system, just like uh, jury duty. Okay. We've now got, <laughs> yeah. We've now got house duty. Yes. Um, hmm, I can't decide. That would be, that might be, I can't decide if that would be harder or easier than my normal job. I definitely, it's not clear that I would be good at it, but you know, maybe it would well, be go easier. back to the whole citizen legislature idea. Yeah, I think um, you know maybe maybe you can start right here. <laughs> Direct democracy in action, starting at, at Secular Hub. Yep. What other examples are there across the world of not having a single member district kind of structure? Are there other countries that are using yeah. strictly proportional uh, representation? Well, I think we see in a lot of countries, including, say, in Britain, um, you or the, the UK or, yeah, many democracies in the European Union, for example, have a sort of parliamentary system where you vote for a party and then the party gets as many representatives as in, is in proportion to their votes. So that's a very that's a very common system. It kind of takes away the geographic aspect which some people really like because they want to have their own representative who is representing their space. But it's definitely, there's definitely working examples of this in, in lots of um, nations. So it sounds like you're talking about using these methods currently to assess maps that are created by humans. Is there any plan to try to use these methods to generate maps or propose maps for legislatures or states? So I think that's a, there's a really interesting um, divide, I think, in the mathematical community on that. I personally um, believe that humans should draw the maps because the, this, on some level, I think that um, map drawing is a deeply human undertaking, right? We're asked to do things like preserve communities of interest, but communities of interest are a very um, sort of, difficult to pin down concept in some way. The idea of a community of interest is it can be a lot of different things and people have to make the case that their community is important. 
and people are, and then somehow once we hear what communities are important, we have to prioritize those communities. And I don't, I think that creating an algorithm to prioritize those communities um, builds in the possibility of terrible bias. Um, at least people know that they are capable of bias and have discussions and try and work through things and, you know, decide what should be most important and, you know, where, you know, we may have to, you know, preserve this community this time and then next time around we maybe preserve another community in preference. And humans are capable of that kind of like squishy decision making and like appreciating the complications of it. If we created an algorithm and just said like whatever comes out of this is fair, it would build in the bias of whoever made that algorithm. And I think that's inherently very dangerous. So um, if we're going to try and do things like preserve communities of interest, I think humans have to draw the maps in order to make that a real open and fair process that's meaningful. So uh, my community, I make a point to say, I'm not saying that the maps that I made are the maps you should use. I'm saying they're context. They're a context of maps created without bias in a, on a scale that humans could not do um, that, so that we can place an actual human drawn map in context not um, in any way examples of things that we should actually be using. Yeah. Of course, there are other people that just like draw compact maps and they love that. So. Yeah, like you touched on that at the very beginning where it's like the technology is more appropriately used to identify those maps that are wrong or not um, appropriate. Yes, that's what I believe. Um, and I think that math is good for lots and lots of things and algorithms can do lots of things well. Um, I don't believe that drawing a map is in the realm of things that I would want to trust to an algorithm. But, you know, I guess if people had a different idea of what was fair, then that, you know, like if everybody could agree on what the algorithm should say, then, you know, maybe that would solve the problem entirely. Sorry, did someone else have a, a comment on that? I was just going to follow up. So I think you mentioned a number of criteria that are um, that maps in Colorado have to hold to, including communities of interest, competitiveness. Do you take into account all of those in the ensemble analysis that you perform? Great question. Um, so I was shaking my head yes, but the answer is no, we couldn't take all of those criteria into account. So for example, the communities of interest are one that Again, I don't think I can responsibly take into account in some way because there are so many communities of interest and it's so hard for any single person to identify and prioritize those in a meaningful way. Um, there are some interesting things that you could do, things like watersheds, where it's like, you know, the lines are drawn and it's, um, you know, really clear that this is a community of interest. But if you um, make the algorithm preserve those, but don't take into account all the other communities of interest, then you're sort of skewing your sample somehow. So I try and be um, very open that we don't include communities of interest. Um, that enabled us to actually uh, answer some interesting political science questions about this. So there's political science professors who have argued that maybe we shouldn't include communities of interest, that they're not important. And what we can see is that like um, in our maps that were drawn without communities of interest, the outcomes were very similar to the maps that were actually enacted, which drew very heavily on communities of interest in drawing them. So it's not clear that communities of interest always um, like skew the partisan outcome in any way. Um, the fairness criteria that we did include were the um, preserving political boundaries. Um, so we, by doing county preservation, we managed to preserve like all of the boundaries mostly within the county. And so we were able to preserve a lot of cities. We didn't, we didn't specifically select for competitive maps um, because that wasn't in the law at the time that the maps that we were comparing to were drawn. We were trying to do, um, come up with maps that suited the laws as of 2011. Um, but we did do some analysis comparing like how competitive maps were when you, for example, preserved counties and when you didn't. Because the notion was that to get competitive maps, you might have to split up um, counties, like you might have to cut Denver into a lot of slices, like we saw with Austin being cut into a lot of slices. But what we found is that, in fact, when you kept counties together, you tended to get more competitive districts just by a small amount than you did when you allowed counties to split freely. So, yeah, the, that was, there's a lot of of uh, competitiveness, or excuse me, there's a lot of fairness criteria. Um, and we tried to take into account 
only the ones barring communities of interest that were valid in 2011. If anybody's interested, um, I do have a fairly technical um, math paper that I can share with you where you can actually see the um, see how these comparisons worked out, like how competitive maps, com you know, inter interacted with asking for maps that preserve county boundaries. So um, that's not publicly posted yet, but I can um, I'll share it with Chauncey as soon as it's up and he can maybe um, share that with anyone who's interested. Absolutely. Cool. All right, other questions? So I've got, I've got one more for you. Sure. There's mention of the redistricting commissions. I guess what would be your advice to someone who might join or participate in one of those yeah. commissions? Well, I, I guess I, on the, advice in what sense like one of my pieces of advice would be listen to me and you know <laughs> take into account like this ensemble analysis method um and really to try and inform yourself a little bit about some of the arguments that people are making for fairness that sometimes like people present stuff and it looks technical and you're like ah, i can't like i'm not going to get my head around it but in fact like you've got your heads around it right now, the ensemble analysis, for example. And things like people argue about things like mean median scores or like the efficiency gap. These are other mathy ways of studying things. They're actually not that complicated as measures. And if you familiarize yourself with them, then you'll have a lot better um, like sense of when those arguments are good or bad, right? That'll help you to be able to evaluate whether you should be like disqualifying a plan because it has some efficiency gap or whatever argument someone's trying to make. Um, so that my advice might be to just try and familiarize yourself with those arguments and also to understand like the crazy history of redistricting in Colorado as it has occurred. Um, and there's a lot of, um, in digging into this process, I started reading about like why the maps that we have were drawn the way they were. And it's complicated and really interesting and rich. And so um, I would just say mm -hmm. there's a lot out there if you're, if you care to, um, to look into it a little bit. And I think that that would make serving on the commission um, all the better to have a chance to, you know, know a little bit about the history. I would also um, on another level, so let me put on my League of Women Voters hat now or whatever, you know, whatever hat it is where I talk about, you know, encouraging people to apply. I would encourage you to apply for both commissions. There's a legislative one like for the state legislature and then there's a congressional one for US House. You can't serve on both commissions, but you can apply to both and you'll just basically double your chances of getting chosen for one of them. And so apply to both um, if that's something that you're interested in. Um, also just apply, apply, apply. We need more people. We, if you know people that could serve on these, especially people that reflect the diversity of the state, then encourage them to apply. Because these commissions are required by law to reflect the um, diversity of Colorado in many ways, the geographic diversity, racial and ethnic diversity, um, gender. Like we need to really make sure that these commissions look like Colorado looks. And so get people that you know out there applying for them and um, please spread the word. I have a question. Uh, when will these redistricting commissions be doing their work? Great. Um, so the applications need to be in by November 10th. Um, then there's this whole process, like it's it's involved. They're really trying to make sure that no bias ends up in this in this process. Um, so there's a very involved process of getting the 12 members of each commission, and those that process completes in March. So really, nothing would happen from now until March. You just kind of watch the process car get carried out. Then once the commission is actually chosen in March, work will begin. Now. What you'll do at first is um, the first maps will be drawn by the nonpartisan staff of the Legislative Council. And then the first job of the commissioners is really to take those maps on the road. There's 21 uh, public hearings about these maps, three in each congressional district. And so the commissioners are in charge of like listening, taking public input and incorporating that and, you know, figuring out how the map should change to reflect what the public um, 
believes and needs out of it. And so then once the, uh, so that'll all happen from March through the summer, then there'll be maybe a revised round and some more meetings. And so what people are saying is that this should start in March and go through the summer, but it might continue on um, a little bit later um, into the year. So that's about the range that you're looking at. It's unclear whether it will be a, a totally full-time job for everybody or whether it would be a part-time job um, during that time. Um, I would say if you're not sure if you have the time, just apply. And if you turns out you don't have the time, then you can like, you know, once you know a little bit more about the um, amount of work that's involved, then you could pull out of the process at that point. But honestly, this is the first time it's happened. So nobody really knows exactly when the work will end. Okay, thank you. Yeah, no problem. All right, any other questions? How many people are on each of these um, groups, committees? There's 12 um, people on each commission. There's four Democrats, four Republicans, and four unaffiliated voters on each commission. And to be qualified for the commission, you have to have, there's some things you, you can't have been a lobbyist or like elected to political office recently. There's some specific rules about that. It's like three to five years. And you also need to have been um, registered as what you are, an affiliated Democrat or Republican for the last five years. And I think you need to have voted in the last two elections, um, the last two major elections, I think. Um, and so there's various qualifications there. Um, but that's that's how the panels will break down. Anyone else? <laughs> All right. Thank you so much for having me here. I really appreciate it. Thank you, Dr. Momskog. We're, we're really <laughs> glad that you could join us. It's a very informative presentation uh, and also kind of at a, at a good level. We've got kind of a weirdly technical audience, so I know a lot of people are like geeking out over the math. So. Thank you so much. I really love speaking with you all. And um, yeah, you're, I, I love your organization. Good job. And please reach out to me if there's anything else that I can help you with. Absolutely. Yes, this was a wonderful presentation. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, thank you. <laughs> All right. So I've uh, I've stolen the screen here, and this is the website that uh, Dr. Momstad Beth was speaking of, redistricting.colorado.gov. You can go there and sign up for one of the commissions. So they've got the congressional redistricting and the legislative redistricting commissions here. I uh, I started my way through the process. It's at least the first. Um, I think five of six steps or so are not too difficult. It's just sort of basically asking you basic questions about your, your past. Um, and then I think it gets a little bit more involved asking for maybe a resume and um, a little bit more information. But uh, as Dr. Momskog recommended, I encourage you to check this out. Consider um, applying to be a commissioner. You having sat through this presentation, uh, having learned about these ways to assess fairness, probably know more than the average person does um, that could sort of guide you in, in getting us to good maps. So please do consider applying. And again, the application deadline there is November 10th. This is, uh, so Dr. Momskog had a symposium a couple of weeks ago, and uh, this is something that came up in it. It's a font uh, that just shows, you know, letters A through Z using various redistricting or sort of gerrymandered districts. I just thought it was kind of cute, so I figured I'd share it. Just search for Jerry font online and you can find it. We here at the Secular Hub are happy you could join us and hope you enjoyed listening to today's talk. To learn more about the Secular Hub and our upcoming events, to become a member, or to show your support, find us on the web at secularhub.org. Before we wrap, I'd like to give a special shout out and thank you to our speaker and also to the volunteers who put in the time and effort to bring this event to life. We see you and we couldn't do this without you.